Welcome Freedom House to our 1030 service. My name is Troy Maxwell. I'm the pastor here. And we also have a lot of people online that are streaming from all over the nation. We've got Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Connecticut, D.C., Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Louisiana, uh, Maine, Minnesota, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, West Virginia, Burundi, Nigeria, Uganda, United Arab Emirates, Canada, and Germany. Can we give them a big hand? Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget, if you're ever in Charlotte, make sure you come by Freedom House. We would love to just roll out the red carpet for you and make you feel at home. Well, uh, you saw by the bumper, by the little video there, that uh, we are starting a series today, a two-part series, that we'll finish up next week called In God We Trust. Did a little research on this and found out that that phrase, In God We Trust, ended up on our money in 1861 because a pastor wrote a letter to the Department of Treasury. And I think it's interesting what he said. He said this in the letter. It says, this would make a beautiful coin. And he had drawn a picture of what he thought the coin, the money should look like with that phrase, in God we trust, to which no possible citizen would object. In other words, all of the United States would recognize that that this is important for us to value our relationship with God. This would relieve us from the uh, disgrace of heathenism. This would place us openly under the divine protection we have personally claimed. Now, I know that uh, anybody that, if you're just kind of new here or uh, you maybe found out today we're talking about church and politics, you're probably a little nervous. You're like, oh my gosh. Some of you maybe even were like, I don't know if I want to come, but you were curious enough to go ahead and get out of bed and come because you wanted just to see what the pastor is going to say today. So how many of you all have already decided who you're going to vote for? Raise your hand if you already decided that. Okay, okay, a little less than half of you. How many of you have no idea who you're going to vote for? Raise your hand. How many are so ready for this to be over with? Raise your hand. Come on. (laughs) Some of you all standing up, a couple people screaming, holding John 316 signs up in the back. How many, how many people in here, not, I know there's not very many of you that are like me, how many of y'all just like starting the political conversation just because you want to get somebody riled up around you at work? Come on. That's the way I am. And I'm a pastor too, so it makes it even worse because I'm not supposed to talk about religion and politics in any kind of conversation. I want to throw up this verse, and I want to start this message with this verse, Psalms 33, verse 12. And I want us all to say this together. So I'm going to count to three, and I want you to read this. Even if you're watching online, I want you to read this out loud. Ready? One, two, three. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Okay, I'll give you like a C minus on that one. Uh, I, w- I, want you to, I want you to do a little better than that. I know you can s- talk louder than that. It's okay to yell in church. It's okay to get a little crazy in church. So I want you to read it one more time. Ready? One, two, three. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Well, I am going to talk about church and politics. And if you have a problem with anything that I say, just send me an email. However, I'm not responsible if it gets deleted or not. So anyway... A couple things that I'm not going to do today is I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not going to do that. Uh, matter of fact, I'm still in the decision period myself. I'm still trying to think through exactly which direction that, that I'm going to go. Um, I believe that we live in, as the church, as the body of Christ, and I believe we live in the most opportunistic time we could ever live in. The enemy is doing his best, the devil, Satan, is doing his best to polarize our country. And I think this is when you and I have the greatest opportunity to shine as bright as possible because people have questions, and guess what? We got the answer. Come on, his name is Jesus. Can I get an amen in church today? Okay, his name is Jesus. He is the one that has all the answers. We will never have the best choice ever, ever, because he's sitting at the throne of God. He's sitting next to God. And so um, I want to give you just a couple quick things as, before I get into this message, just to make sure that we're on the same page, and just some practical things uh, to, to make sure over the next two weeks that you have your mind right. First of all, be careful what you listen to in the media. 
Um, I, 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 you know, we, as a church, we've been involved in the media. Nothing against you if you work for radio, television, or whatever. Um, nothing against you. Love you. Um, I, I love the media. However, uh, just like any company, the media is looking to make M-O-N-E-Y. Okay, they're looking to make money. And how do you make money? Controversy. Controversy. That's English for controversy. Controversy. So, Controversy sells, and so if they can stir things up, if they can bring videos and show this and show that, there is an agenda, okay? The media does have an agenda, and it's money. They want money, so they're going to do anything they can to make sure that you watch what they're talking about. If con- controversy wasn't a big deal, then we wouldn't have shows like The Kardashians and Robin China would never make it on television, okay? Just saying. Nothing against you if you're watching today, um, Kim, <laughs> just, just saying. <laughs> um, also, also educate yourself. You know, t- take some time. Don't just do what you did last time. Don't just do what Grandma says you should do. Okay, take some time. Educate yourself at the local level. There is more to this election than just um, the two people at the top. Okay, there's a lot more that's going on. Uh, and a lot more involvement for you. So educate yourself. Look at the platforms. Um, look at your, uh, you know, discover, and we're going to talk more about this, but you know, your morals and, and where you stand. And don't complain unless you're going to do something about it. In other words, vote. Okay, vote. Let me give you just a little statistic real quick that happened in 2012. In our country, there's close to 400 million people that call the United States of America home. Of those 400, close to 400 million, there are 100 million evangelicals, evangelical Christians. Well, in 2012, um, half didn't even register to vote. Okay, now I just want you to think about the power of 100 million votes out of close to 400 million in a country. Not only that, not only do, did half of them not even vote, Half of that half didn't even, I'm sorry, didn't register to vote. Half of that half didn't even vote at all. Didn't even go to the polls that were registered to vote. So don't complain. And listen, church, please. I'm your pastor. Everybody say, I love you, Pastor Troy. Please, please don't use Facebook as your platform to get on everybody's business. Please stop. I mean, goodness, have a face-to-face. Take them out to coffee if you want to tell them how wrong they are. Come on, don't, don't, don't just use Facebook. You think, but I like Facebook. I can hide behind Facebook. Exactly. Don't be a chicken. Do it face to face. Can I get an amen? Uh, so here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about you know, the direction of our country, and because I love the United States. I mean, I, this is a wonderful country. We live in the best country in the world. Amen? We do. We do. Uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're not excited about America, let me take you some places. Okay, I'll just take you on a little missions trip, and we'll visit some pl- I've been, some bi- visit one of the nations that I've been to, and you will do everything you can to make sure you get back to this wonderful place where we have the freedoms. And thank you so much to the military. Can we give our military a big hand for what they do? I love it so much. You know, I go to Virginia Beach. I have some good friends in Virginia Beach. And they have, uh, you know, if you're, if you're there for any amount of time, you'll hear these jets go over Virginia Beach. And it's loud. I mean, crazy loud. And the first couple of times I was there, I was like, oh, my gosh, how do you put up with that? I mean, that is just so loud. And then one of my friends pointed a bumper sticker that says, what you hear is the sound of freedom. And I was like, yeah, man, come on. And I was like, yeah, whoosh. I was like, yeah, baby, go get them. In Jesus' name. So anyway, what I was thinking about this week is I was looking at the children of Israel, and I was thinking about the direction of our country, the direction of our world, where we are in the state of the prophetic calendar and kind of everything that's going on and and what we're seeing. And I thought about the plagues in Egypt, and I just want to encourage you. My purpose in these two weeks is to simply encourage you. For, For you to walk out of these meetings, of these services, with these messages, and not be afraid. Just to take a big, deep breath out and realize that God truly is in control. Okay, He hasn't fallen asleep. 
He's not missing out on what's going on in the United States. He has his finger on the pulse of what's happening. There is a plan. And just because you don't know exactly what that plan is doesn't mean that God's not running it, okay? So he is involving this. Now, I was thinking about the children of Israel, specifically in Egypt, when Moses was drawing them out, when he was sent to deliver them. And you remember, he did 10 plagues in order to get the Pharaoh's attention. And if you remember the ninth plague, many people don't talk about the ninth plague. It was right before the last one where they took the firstborn. But the ninth plague was darkness covered all of Egypt. I mean, darkness so strong that you couldn't even see your hand in front of you. However, in every one of the dwellings of the children of Israel, there was light. And I want to encourage you, no matter how dark it may get in the world around us, you are the light of the world. That you have a responsibility. There is light in your home. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? Now, so here's what I want to do today. What I want to do do today is I want to challenge you with one simple thought. One simple thought that I'm going to focus on today. And my challenge to you, my challenge to the church, my challenge to you watching, my challenge to the body of Christ is Can you put your faith before your political opinion? Can you do it? Will you, on November 8th, will you, and from then on, put your faith before your political opinion? Now, I hear what you're saying. I I can hear it in your head already. You're saying, but I am putting my faith before my political opinion because I'm a Republican. And all, all Republicans know that God is Republican. I mean, God is right. It'll trickle, it'll trickle. Jesus sits at the right hand of God. So we know that God is a Republican. Pastor, I am putting my faith because Jesus even hung out with publicans and sinners, which are short for Republicans. Everybody knows that in the Bible. I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, all right, now, you know what, Pastor? I don't know why you're even talking about this because I'm a Democrat and everybody knows that God's a Democrat. I mean, Acts 10, 38 says that Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. I mean, Jesus was a walking everybody health care plan. <laughs> everybody should get health care. Jesus is a perfect example of that with sandals on. Everybody knows, everybody knows that Jesus fed the masses And so he's in favor of increasing the welfare program. I mean, and Jesus even made it very clear that it was hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He's for the middle class. Right? I know what you're saying. You're saying, you know, God, I am putting my faith before my political opinion because I'm a libertarian. And we all know that God is for freedom. I mean, the Bible even tells us that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I mean, we all know that scripture, so God is a libertarian. Okay, okay. All right, so, so, so I understand where we are, but we all have an opinion. So I'm asking you to put your faith before your political opinion. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 2 says this. It says, we are all in love with our own opinions. We all, we all have one. We all have an opinion. We are all in love with our own opinions. Convinced, guess what? I'm right. My opinion's right. But, everybody say but. That's a big old but right there. But the Lord is in the midst of us. Doing what? What is he doing in the midst of us? He's testing and probing our motive. So my challenge to you is to put your faith before your political opinion. So how do I do that? How do I adjust my attitude, adjust my thought, adjust my walk to make sure that I'm putting my faith before my political opinion? Well, I want to give you a couple thoughts around this. The first is that in order to put my faith before my opinion, before my political opinion, I have to solidify my worldview. Okay, as a Christian, if I want to walk this out, because of how many of you know that God is not Republican? Okay, let's just be honest. Let's make sure that we all understand that God's not a Democrat that God's not an independent. Okay, God doesn't have a side. He is a side. Okay, so we got to understand that, that he, he, he's not, that's not his, he doesn't have a political agenda, and we're not going to legislate light. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. We are 
the ones who are to spread that light. So how do we do that? We have to solidify. I have to, in order to put my faith before my, my political opinion, I have to solidify my worldview. What is a worldview? What, is, what does it mean to have a worldview? Every person in this room and every person watching, you all have a worldview. A worldview is simply the lens in which you view your life and make your values. How you determine how you walk life out. How you respond to circumstances. How you respond to agendas. How you respond to pressure is determined by your world view. And as a Christian, your world view is being attacked. There's a lot of pressure for you to not have a biblical worldview. A lot of pressure because the minute that you begin to declare that you're a Christian, you are labeled and set in a specific place. You, you, are, you are called, you're, you're going to risk name calling when you decide a worldview. You're going to be called intolerant, yeah, yeah. not accepting, yeah. narrow-minded. If you've never been called that before, then maybe because you don't have a Christian worldview. And so I want to challenge you to solidify that. I was having a, um, many, many years ago, uh, we had a gentleman, young, young man, who got radically saved in our church. Uh, we knew him personally because he lived in our neighborhood, and great, great young man, L life completely changed, and uh, my, my, my kids invited him to church, and he was, his family was going through a divorce, and it was really challenging for him, and, and so he got involved in church, and he had, been, he had grown up going to church, his family had gone to church. Um, but when he came to Freedom House, he realized that there was a, something a lot different about the environment. Presence of God. Never experienced the presence of God. Nor had he ever read the Bible for himself. And, you know, we believe that you need to read the Bible every day. Spend time in the Word. And so he started reading the Bible every day. In the meantime, while his family was dealing with these challenges, his sister uh, came out and said that she was a lesbian. That she was uh, attracted to other girls younger than him, and his mom, you know, struggling, going through these challenges, and we ministered to the whole entire family, and as he began to read the Bible, he realized that, there, that the lifestyle that was being projected in his family was very different than what God said our lifestyle should be, and so he actually went to his, his mom and said, hey, listen, I want to talk to you about the Bible. I would love to share with you what I'm reading in the Bible, and her response was, I believe the Bible, however, when it comes to this particular situation, I don't think God is right. Now you say, oh my gosh, I can't believe anybody would say that. Well, we don't necessarily say it with our mouth, but sometimes we say it with our lifestyle. See, there are competing worldviews. There are worldviews that are being pressed upon us in our culture. Romans 12, verse 2 says this. It says, and do not be conformed do not be squeezed into the mold of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Competing worldviews, pressuring you to change the way you see life. One of them is materialism. Materialism is a competing worldview. What is materialism? The only thing that is important is the acquisition and the accumulation of wealth. In other words, my life is built around trying to get more. I want to keep up with the Joneses. I need a better car. I need a better house. Now, there's nothing wrong with having better things, but there is something wrong when those things have you, when they control you. The other competing worldview is also humanism, secular humanism. This is very prominent in our society right now, in our culture, because it, humanism is all about me that I'm going to create my own theology because of the reason and the logic in which I want to see my life be projected and ultimately that I want to be God, that I want to be God of my life. I want to be independent. And as a result, that this humanism is pressed upon us. Now, what ends up happening is, is that our biblical worldview is, is injected with these other things and it becomes commingled. Where, where we start to stray away from our relationship with God for the sake of these competing worldviews. The third is hedonism. 
Hedonism is a very prolific worldview, and hedonism simply is whatever feels good, it must be right. Because there's no way that God would ever want me to be unhappy. So, so I, I need to do everything I can so that I can be happy. So why, God's not going to get mad at me if I have extramarital affairs. I mean, because he wants me to be happy. I'm not happy right now, so let me just go and be happy. And he's going to still love me. And I just, whatever feels good, do it. The, the, the fourth competing worldview is pluralism. A pluris, pluralistic society. Now, I came into confrontation with this when I was, uh, my wife and I went on a little trip for our 24th wedding anniversary, and we were on this plane, and um, I got, because of my status, I got upgraded to first class, and because I'm a loving husband, I gave her the seat. So I let her sit in the front row. Can I, all the men said, yes, Lord. You know, that was a, it was a good day in the Maxwell house that day. And so, but in order to do that, I ended up having to sit in a middle seat, okay? And if you've ever done any traveling, the middle seat is all about who gets to the seat first because there's only four armrests and you want to make sure you're the first one there so you can claim the two in the middle. <laughs> Otherwise, you're doing elbow wrestling the whole entire time. And so I get on the plane. It's only about an hour and a half flight and, and I am, um, I'm working on my message. You know, I'm getting ready because it's a Saturday. I'm coming home and I'm getting ready to preach that night, uh, that, that morning and, and I've got my headphones on. And to be honest with you, I really don't want to talk to anybody um, I love everybody, but I just didn't want to talk to anybody. However, the person beside me wanted to talk to me. He says, hey, what, what are you working on there on your computer? I'm like, dude, what are you looking at my computer for? <laughs> I've got headphones on. They're the noise canceling, and you, can't you tell that I'm, I'm not really interested in like, having a conversation right now, and I just need to kind of stay in my world? And so we start talking, and he goes, so what do you do? And now, now I'm in a big dilemma <laughs> because, because, you know, I'm a pastor, and the minute that you say that you're a pastor, it's like the floodgates open. And, and, I, and I, knew he, he, I knew that he was from another country um, because of his, his, uh, the color of his skin and just kind of his accent and everything. And I'm thinking, all right, should I tell him I'm a pastor? Sometimes I'll just say I'm a spiritual architect, you know, so, you know just, and then that's confusing and then it just shuts them down, you know, like they don't even, like what's a spirit, oh, it's very complicated, you know, just a very complicated job. He wouldn't want to hear about it. Anyway, <laughs> I know you're thinking, man, is he even saved? Like, <laughs> sometimes you just need a little quiet. You know what I'm talking about. So anyway, we start this conversation. I find out that he's a doctor. He's a scientist. And he travels back and forth from New York uh, because he, he is a, on, um, in a position as a professor at the Albert Einstein uh, Medical Institute. So extremely intelligent. And so he's asking me, he starts asking me questions, and I start actually enjoying the conversation, and he starts asking me things, and he's writing stuff down the whole time, like on his phone, I'm like, what are you doing, what are you writing down? He goes, I'm actually, I'm actually writing a book, and I'm, I'm putting these sayings together that I think are very good, and he starts talking about his Hindu religion, and, but he says it in a way that I've, uh, it, it really kind of um, intrigued me because I felt like that this was the Lord showing me the way our world is going. And he says, tell me about Christianity. I know a little bit about it. I've read a few chapters in the Bible, but I'd love to learn more. And so I started talking to him about my relationship with Jesus and how I used to be an alcoholic and a drug addict and God saved me and changed me. I just started sharing my story. And, and he goes, man, that is very interesting. I kind of believe the same thing. And I said, well, I don't understand. You say you're a Hindu. I said, yeah. He goes, well, I am a Hindu, but I also believe that, that Buddhists are, are okay and Islam is okay. Matter of fact, I believe that all religions are different languages in which we speak to all the same God. And at that moment, I realized that this is how many people think. This is, this is what happens when you start to declare your worldview. That people say, yeah, I believe in God, but I also believe that all roads lead to the same God. Now, here's, the, here's my dilemma. My, my, my challenge is, what do I do now? Because that ain't truth. There's only one way to get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Allah is not Jehovah. Buddha is not Jehovah. Are you following what I'm talking about? And so now I'm in a dilemma. And see, that is the same dilemma that many of us face every single day. So you have to solidify in order to put your faith before your political correctness, 
you're going to have to solidify your Christian, your biblical worldview. Now, in order for me to have that, there's some non-negotiables. I'm going to give you those non-negotiables. If you want to write these down, they're going to be on the screen as well. Non-negotiables if I call myself a Christian. First of all is I believe that Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. Not, not just Savior. Not just fire insurance. I want to miss out on hell. I'm talking he's my boss. I listen to what he says. That the Bible, here, here's the second thing is that I believe that the word of God is inerrant. In other words, from Genesis to Revelation, that this book has no errors in it. That this is God's breathed word for you and me. It doesn't mean that I open it up and I start ripping out pages that don't fit into my cultural scheme of life. That don't necessarily fit into social, uh, social conversations. That I start to drop things off and go, well, I really don't like Romans 1, and I really don't like what Leviticus says, and I really don't like this because it might offend somebody. No, your biblical worldview will offend somebody. Jesus offended people. He got people upset with him so many times that, that they wanted to kill him often, and they eventually did. They eventually did crucify him because of what he stood for. I believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe that the word of God is an error. If I want a, to solidify my worldview. And then thirdly, that I, I understand that I have dual citizenship. That I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. That though I live in this world, I am not of this world. That I understand my spiritual position. That I'm here for, you know, 90, 100, 120 years. But then after that, matter of fact... What happens after that, this is just but a blip. My life here on this earth is just, just a, a breath, just a wind that just blows by. Eternity is so much bigger. And that I view life from that, per, that perspective. So if I want to put my faith before my political opinion, I've got to solidify my worldview. Secondly, if I want to put my faith, and oh, let me read this verse to you. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 in the message paraphrase. Listen to this. Same verse that I just read to you, except I want to read it to you in the message paraphrase. It says, don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you, what he wants from you, and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you develops well-formed maturity in you. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Don't let the world conform you, put you into its pattern. So how do I put my faith before my political opinion? Here's the second thing, is I've got to understand authority. Or another way to say it would be I need to understand the origin of authority. Now this is probably the hardest thing about what we're dealing with right now because I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, how in the world do we have these two options? I mean, come on, let's just be honest. Like, where did they come from? I, I've watched the debates. I've watched it all on television. I'm like, oh, Jesus. Like, what in the world is going on? And I'm sure that you, you had that same question. So let me give you the answer. Let me help you understand this. See, the reason we have what has been presented to us is because this is where we are as a nation. Israel, let me just give you a quick story, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a scripture with you, a couple of scriptures with you. Israel was delivered out of Egypt, and... Moses came in, he delivered them out of Egypt, and the purpose of them being delivered, the Israelites, God's chosen people delivered out of Egypt, was for the purpose of worshiping God in the wilderness. And they were supposed to basically take about 10 or 11 days, walk through the wilderness, and enter into the promised land that was promised to Abraham. And what was supposed to be an 11-day journey ended up being a 40-year book, okay? I mean, it lasted a long time. The Bible would have been a lot shorter if they only spent 11 days, let's just be honest. So 40 years later... 
they finally get into the promised land because, see, God had a hard time getting Egypt out of Israel. It was easy getting Israel out of Egypt, but it was really hard getting Egypt out of Israel. But it took them that long to get them out, so he had to basically get rid of one whole generation and raise up a whole new generation. So they get into the promised land, and it's like, all right, we got them in the promised land, everything's going to be good. However, when they get there, they start looking at all the nations, and they start complaining to God, we want a king. We want a king. Give us a king. Everybody else has a king. We want a king. Give us a king, God. We want a king. We want a king, God. We want a king, God. That's what, I mean, just over and over and over again. So God gives them judges. Doesn't work. They don't like that. We want a king, God. See, many times God will give you what you want even though it's not what you need. And that's exactly what has happened to us. The leadership that we have before us is a product of the values that portray our nation right now. Now, here's the key. Here's the key. Listen, look, 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 look. We can change that. That's where the church can shine. Because we have the answer. And you say, well, no, no, no. Well, well, it's just me. No, 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 no. It's all of us together. If we can start going in the right direction, we can see a shift in our country. We can see a shift in our schools. We can see a shift in, in our local and state government. We can see everything shift because many of you have incredible influence. You're full of the Holy Spirit. And it's time to raise our voice and begin to shout from the housetops who the answer is. Amen? Let's not step back and go, oh, I don't know what's going on. No, we know what's going on. Jesus uh, has many, has j- just had three conversations that I can find in the Bible politically, like that were sort of involving politics. One was involving taxes. One was involving, as after he had uh, been raised from the dead, his disciples asked him about the kingdom. But one that was very specific and gives us the answer to the origin of authority is when Jesus has a conversation with Pontius Pilate. Pilate was given uh, oversight over the Jews from Rome. And he he was sitting in a precarious seat because he needed to obey Rome but also wanted to be liked by the people of the Jews. And so when they brought Jesus to him to crucify him because the Jews couldn't crucify him, So they brought him to Pontius Pilate and said, you killed Jesus. Pontius Pilate was like, but I don't want to kill Jesus. You take care of him. And they go, we can't do it. You need to do it. He's saying that he's above you, that he's a king. And so Pilate comes to Jesus in John chapter 8, and he asks him, are you really a king? Because they're telling me you're a king. Can you answer me and tell me if you're a king? And here's what Jesus said in verse 36. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, this is important. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Now, look at me for a second. Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross. He knew he was going to die. Pilate had the power to kill him, which we'll see in just a second. Why could Jesus say that? Because Pilate had his eyes on the circumstances of the world, and Jesus was seeing it from a heavenly perspective. Pilate saw the death of Jesus as a failure. Jesus knew because of where he was from that his death was a great victory. In other words, Jesus had a kingdom perspective. Then Jesus, listen, then Pontius Pilate sends him away. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do. His wife comes to him and says, look, you need to leave this guy alone. Like, because I'm having dreams about him. Like, you need to leave him alone. And so he sends him out. He gets beaten. Jesus does. Put a crown of thorn on his head. Then he comes back. And, and they're, you know, yelling again, crucify him, crucify him. You know, one, one day they're hail him, hail him. The next day they're nail him, nail him. And, and, and Pilate comes to Jesus and he says, don't you understand that, that Pilate says, I have the power to crucify you. I have the power to let you go. But notice Jesus' response in John chapter 19, verse 11. Jesus answered and said, now listen, this will help us free ourselves from fear of what's going on right now. Jesus said, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. That's why Paul could say in Romans chapter 13, in the midst 
of incredible persecution from Nero. Romans 13, when Nero was persecuting Christians, you, you think there's pressure right now. Nero was feeding Christians to lions. Nero was lighting his garden with Christians on stakes burning, killing Christians. And Paul writes this to Christians. He says, Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, I know what you're thinking, but God didn't appoint these. Yes, he did. If we believe that the Bible is true, then we have to believe that God has a plan for America. He has a plan. Now, you say, I don't see the plan. I don't either. But thank God he knows what's going on. Can I get an amen? Let me give you one more quick example, and then we'll move on to the last thing. Isaiah, who was one of the greatest prophets, wrote more about Jesus than any other prophet. Matter of fact, he prophesied about Jesus in Isaiah 53 to a letter. He spoke, I mean, super prophetically. 600 years prior to Jesus even showing up, he was he was uh, specific on how he would die. He was sp specific on how he would look when he would die. I mean, line by line, precept upon precept. I mean, s specific things that he said. Now, Isaiah wasn't always like that. He wasn't always as direct. See, if you read the first five chapters of Isaiah, you find that Isaiah is a little soft in his prophetic utterance, his prophetic voice. Why? Why was that? Because he had a very close friend in the king, Uzziah. Uzziah, who was the earthly king. Isaiah loved Uzziah. But something shifts in Isaiah chapter 6. It starts in verse 1 when it says this. You can look at it. Isaiah 6, 1. It says, In the year that king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Now this is important because what God did for Isaiah was to say, listen, you trusted so much in this man and his agenda. I want you to see who is the man, the one who is in true control, the one who will everlastingly sit on this throne. And he gave him a picture of God sitting on the throne. Listen to me, church. Whenever you feel the tendency to maybe have a little bit of fear, Whenever you might think that things are going awry, you just close your eyes and you picture God sitting on that throne because he will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen? Isn't that fantastic to know? Come on, give Jesus a big hand clap today. And then lastly, last thing I want to share with you today. So if I want to put my faith before my political opinion, I've got to solidify my worldview. I've got to understand the origin of authority. And then lastly, I've got to love people. Church, this is our mission. This is our mission as people. We have a lot of people that are hurting. We have a lot of people that are concerned. A lot of people that are struggling. This is the great equalizer, in my opinion. Sure, the enemy would love, love, love to take what happens, whether you like it or not, whether the person that gets into the seat of the presidency you like or not, or whether the person that sits in the, in the position of governor or mayor, whatever, whatever, the enemy would love to continue to divide you, to separate you, black from white, brown from black, white from a little whiter. He would love to continue to separate you. Would love to do that. But the great equalizer... And the thing that I believe Jesus wants us to understand most importantly is that we need to love people. See, Jesus is confronted right before he's getting ready to go to the cross. And this lawyer, this attorney comes to him and says, what's the most important thing that I need to know? Can you tell me what the most important commandment is? If I do one thing, what should it be? Can you tell me, what is the most important commandment? In Matthew chapter 22, verse 38, Jesus says to him, you need to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But here, here's the deal. Jesus doesn't stop right there. Now, if he did, 
we would love that. I'm sure everybody listening would have loved for him to stop right there and just say, oh, I, I just need to love God. Because this involves in, 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 internally. Like, I love God. Sure, I love God. And matter of fact, if you were to ask any of the politicians that are on that list, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Independent, you ask them, do you love God? I'm going to tell you right now. They'd say, yeah, of course I love God. Yeah, I love God. Do you love him with all your heart? Yeah, for the most part. How about with all your soul? I don't really know what my soul is, but sure. I'm sold out. That was bad. That was a bad joke right there. How about, how about your mind? You love him with all your mind? Well, I think about him occasionally. You know, I, yeah, sure, I love him with all my mind. But see, Jesus doesn't stop right there. It would be easy, easy for us to love God with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength because it really doesn't matter what we do as long as we say we love him internally. But Jesus, without a breath, says the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Another way to say it this way. Let me tell you what number one is and let me tell you what number one is. <laughs> it's not number one and number two. This is number one. This, this, is, this is the kingdom of God, that we love God and the expression of that love is loving people. So let me challenge you. If you want to put your faith before your political opinion, don't let your opinion ruin the influence of the, your faith having an impact on someone's life. Don't let it remove you or jeopardize your influence in reaching someone. Hey, listen, be a student, not a critic. Be confident in who you are, but seek to understand more than be understood. Look at people's lives. And in this time right now, we have the answer. Jesus said this in closing. Let me just say, Jesus made this statement about you and me. He says, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are a city that is set on a hill. Let's be that in this season. Amen? Stand up on your feet. Give Jesus a big hand clap today. Come on. Give him a big hand clap. Would you grab somebody's hand beside you? Come on, just grab somebody's hand. Hold their hand. If you're single, this is your moment. This is your moment. <laughs> you're watching online. Just pretend like there's somebody standing beside you. Would you just close your eyes? and I just want to pray this over you. Father, we just come together today as the body of Christ. And we do this not just here at Freedom House, but God, we do this as a symbol that will reach around churches around the nation, around the city, around this region. That, Father, we're together in this. That, God, our faith needs to be at the forefront of our life. That, God, on November 8th, on Election Day, when we stand in that box, God, that we will thank God first. We will, we will come into that position prayerfully, Lord, our heart full of the Holy Spirit. Father, help us to be the church in this hour. Give us influence. Increase our platform. Use us in this day to see change, to see the values rise up. God, to see our nation come back to you, Lord. You said in your word, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways and pray that you would heal our land. And Father, that's our prayer today, that you would come and heal our land. Heal us today. Heal our differences today. We rebuke you, devil. You have no authority in our life and our family. And we declare that Jesus is Lord. We declare Jesus.